Hello, and you're listening to Eco Justice Radio. We present environmental and climate stories from a social justice frame featuring voices not necessarily heard on mainstream media. Eco Justice Radio acknowledges that we recorded this show on the traditional territory of the Ahachiman people, also known as the Waneño of Southern California. Welcome, I am Jack Eit. On today's show, Simon Bolivar, the Monroe Doctrine, and U.S. intervention in Latin America. Historian Greg Grandin and journalist Michael Fox examine the long shadow of the Monroe Doctrine, which continues to shape U.S. imperialism in Latin America today. Greg Grandin is the author of Fordlandia, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, and the National Book Critics Circle Award. A professor of history at Yale University, Grandin has published a number of other award-winning books, including Empire's Workshop, The Last Colonial Massacre, and The Blood of Guatemala. We start with a clip on the history and accomplishments of Venezuelan statesman and military officer Simón Bolívar, who led six Latin American countries to their independence from Spain and today is known as El Liberador, from NBC News. Bogotá, Colombia. Cairo, Egypt. New York, New York. Three different cities on three separate continents. Yet all three pay homage to Simón Bolívar, a military and political leader who helped Latin America gain its independence from Spain in the early 19th century. In 1783, Simón Bolívar was born in Caracas, Venezuela, a colony of Spain. He belonged to a social class known as Creoles, wealthy Latin Americans of European descent who owned ranches, mines, and businesses in South America. Bolívar's family owned several gold and copper mines. After the death of his parents, Bolívar moved to Spain and completed his formal education in Europe. It was there that he was first exposed to the Enlightenment ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity, and the concept of representative government that had been forged in the wake of the American and French revolutions. Bolivar longed to liberate his people from Spanish control and bring a representative government to Venezuela. He also sought to abolish slavery, calling it the daughter of darkness. In 1808, after Napoleon Bonaparte named his brother Joseph the King of Spain and all of its colonies, Bolivar joined the fight for Venezuelan independence. The First Republic of Venezuela was established after an uprising in 1810, but it was toppled by Spanish forces in 1812. Bolívar restored the Venezuelan Republic in 1813, after several military engagements known as the Admirable Campaign. During the campaign, Bolívar, in a bold maneuver, led his troops over the Andes Mountains to surprise Spanish forces in Bogotá. After a series of victories, his people proclaimed him El Libertador, or the Liberator. Bolívar continued to sweep through Latin America, securing an essential alliance with the Argentinian general José de San Martín. Together, they liberated Peru. In 1825, the Congress of Upper Peru created the Republic of Bolivia to honor Bolívar. In a speech called the Angostura Address, Bolívar said, the most perfect system of government is that which results in the greatest possible measure of happiness and the maximum of social security and political stability. Bolívar helped create Gran Colombia, a federation that is now the countries of Colombia, Venezuela, Panama, and Ecuador. Although the federation would ultimately fail, Bolívar acknowledged his people's successful fight for independence, telling them, those who served the revolution have plowed the sea. The countries that had formed Gran Colombia went on to govern themselves independently. Simón Bolívar died in 1830. To this day, he stands as a source of inspiration in Latin America and throughout the world for his dedication to the Enlightenment ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity. Mm-hmm. 
Chilean folk music group Inti Iyimani doing the song Simon Bolivar from 1973. In this show, journalist Michael Fox dives into the past and present with Yale historian Greg Grandin. The interview comes from Fox's excellent podcast series called Under the Shadow. The podcast is produced in partnership between the Real News Network and NACLA, the North American Congress on Latin America. Today, I'm going to travel back to that time and then walk up to the present with historian Greg Grandin. Well, my name is Greg Grandin, and I teach history at Yale University. And I'm the author of a number of books, the most recent one being The End of the Myth. Greg is also the former executive editor of the NACLA Report on the Americas, which co-produces this podcast. And he's really prolific. He's the author of numerous books focusing on U.S. intervention in Latin America, The Last Colonial Massacre, Empire's Workshop, The Blood of Guatemala, Kissinger's Shadow, and so many more incredible reads. I'll place links in the show notes. I first interviewed him almost 20 years ago, and I'm so excited to feature his insight on Under the Shadow. I recorded this interview with him late last year when I was just drafting the first few episodes of this podcast series and before I visited the Bolivar Monument in Panama City. We'll be diving into Simón Bolívar's Panama Congress, but also Monroe and the legacy of U.S. imperialism in the region until today. Here it is. So like I was mentioning, I want to start with kind of the big picture, go all the way back. You know, obviously I'm, I'm talking about U.S. intervention. If you could talk about Monroe Doctrine how it was created, why, and how it laid the foundation for centuries of what we've seen in, until then, you know, U.S. intervention and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, other countries have statements. We have doctrines, you know, and that's the thing. And it wasn't, it wasn't really a doctrine. It was the 200th anniversary just a few days ago of the Monroe Doctrine, meaning President James Monroe in the State of the Union Address, which – he delivered, which he delivers a transcript to Congress at the time. He didn't actually give the address. Talked about the United States' relationship with soon-to-be independent countries within the Western Hemisphere. This was a time when 1823 was a moment in which it became clear that Spain had lost the Americas, except for Cuba and Puerto Rico. But uh, but Bolivar had won his wars, San Martin. In, in Chile and Peru had won his wars, Argentina, Mexico, were all going to be free. And the United States had spent a long time, well, the United States political elite, you know, people who ran its foreign policy at the time, James Monroe, it was kind of 1823. So we're talking about, you know, three or four decades after independence. So it's really talking about the either the younger founders or 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 second generation political leaders of the United States. John Quincy Adams, um, uh, John Calhoun, James Monroe, uh, Henry Clay, uh, senator from, from Tennessee, from Kentucky, that was very influential in foreign policy. And they were trying to figure out what to do and say about an uh, you know, a free, a free, what would soon be a free Spanish America, and what the United States' opinion was. There was a lot of things to consider, and mostly they were looking at that question vis-a-vis -vis Europe, their alliance with Great Britain, their rivalry with the Holy Roman Empire and Russia, uh, their fear of France, and fear of a, an attempt to reconquer uh, the Americas for for the Bourbon crown. So there was a lot of things at stake. And the United States had, had kept its card, you know, basically kept silent as these wars went on. I mean, the Spanish-American wars for independence weren't like the United States. They weren't like a few years of fighting, you know, and a, and a handful of battles, famous battles. They went on, went on for decades. They started basically in 1810, and they went on to 1823, and, and, and they took a took place across the entire expanse of South America, Central America, and Mexico, and uh, and the Caribbean. And these were bloody, destructive wars. And the United States watched it all, and, you know, and, and held its counsel. They didn't know what to do. They, you know, uh, on the one hand, they wanted Spain out of the Americas. On the other hand, they didn't, they, they didn't want these new nations to either 
form a single nation among themselves. And, and that wasn't very likely considering the geography, considering the political differences between. And so they didn't issued no grand pronouncements until until Monroe did at the end of 1823, December 2nd, 1823, in a statement that was mostly written by his Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams. The idea at first was to make a joint announcement with Great Britain to claim that no part of the Americas are open to reconquest. But Adams thought it was better if the United States just does it, did it unilaterally. And it's a very ambiguous statement. And in many ways, the power of, the, of what becomes known as the Monroe Doctrine lies in that ambiguity. It could reconcile different positions. So, you know, just to break it down in its simplest components, you had people like Henry Clay, who imagined creating what he called an American system that included Latin America, a large manufacturing and agricultural customs union, perhaps. But, you know, the United States as the kind of core to the Latin American periphery, he was a, you, you might call that an early version of internationalism. John Quincy Adams was, I don't want to say he was an isolationist, but he was more, he was much more of a unilateralist. And he has a famous quote, there is an American system and it's called the United States. You know, basically we didn't need Latin America. So what, the, what, you know, what the Monroe Doctrine does is it allows for a reconciliation of all of these different positions in its, in, in its ambiguity. And it was very vague on what the intentions were. I mean, you know, basically summed up, it said that, quote, unquote, the free and independent nations of the two American continents were off limits for future colonization by any European power. And Monroe let it be known that any effort to, quote, unquote, extend Europe's system to any portion of the hemisphere would be viewed as the United States as a threat. That's like the core of what we think of as the as as the Monroe Doctrine. Monroe said that Europe is essentially different from the United States, but he doesn't define what that difference is. He talks about two different systems, and it's implied that the two different systems are republicanism and imperial imperial monarchism, but, but doesn't quite come out and say that. He just talks about different systems. And um, the United States would, despite making this very broad claim, uh, continue to, to recognize Europe's possessions of, of areas of the New World that weren't being contested, such as British Guyana or Canada, Jamaica, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, where there were no strong independence movements at the time. What's interesting about the Monroe Doctrine is that we think of it now as this doctrine of, of, of mandatory power, where the United States is assigning to itself the role to police Latin America, as it had become. Right. There's there's the Theodore Roosevelt's famous corollary where where it assumes the United States has the right to impose its will on on reckless or irresponsible nations. But at the time, the Monroe Doctrine was celebrated by Latin by independence leaders. One, they were happy that the United States seemed to finally come out for Latin America, Spanish American independence. That was a huge thing. I mean, the, the, wow. there was still a couple of big battles left before Spain finally gave up completely. But the more important thing is that they read in the Monroe Doctrine a corollary to their own anti-colonialism. They didn't read it as a doctrine of neo-colonialism. They read it as a doctrine as anti-colonialism, that you know, no part of the Americas is, is eligible for reconquest. They saw it as analogous to their own anti-colonialism. So there was a lot of um, celebratory messages to Monroe from Latin American leaders thanking him for the doctrine, you know, not the doctrine, but for the pronouncement. And then and, and then it wasn't until later on that we could talk about how it evolves into what it became. But at first it was it was it, it was celebrated by, by, by Spanish America's independence leaders. That's so fascinating, Greg. <laughs> That's like, we just don't even remember that history. Now, I, I want to kind of transition into kind of what it evolved to, why. And, and you mentioned the Roosevelt Corollary that I think is, is really key, which kind of puts it into, into high gear. I guess the first question is, 200-year anniversary, what would you say its, its, its legacy is today? 
Well, I would say the Monroe Doctrine is kind of the gateway legal principle that allows the United States to reconcile idealism and realism or isolationism and internationalism, right? It's the, you know, there's something about the United States where those, all those concepts are very slippery, right? I, or, you know, the Republicans are isolationists, except for Latin America. You know, Latin America is ours and we have to police it. That's kind of a, that, you know, it's a slippery slope towards, an, well, once you say that, that's a slippery slope towards, towards, towards a more robust globalism. You know, so it, it's, again, go, you know, going back to its foundational uh, vagueness and ambiguity. It, it allows the reconciliation of different political positions. It did it at its founding, and it continued to do so as it went on. Um, you know, Woodrow Wilson, for instance, just to give you an example. Woodrow Wilson was complicated, and he's. I mean, I'm not carrying any water for Woodrow Wilson, but 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 his relationship with Latin America, he he. He did. He did agree with Latin America that the Monroe, that the heart of the Monroe Doctrine was a kind of anti-colonialism, and that spirit of the Monroe Doctrine should become the basis of the League of Nations, a world doctrine. When he kept on trying to sell the League of Nations, he kept on talking about the Monroe Doctrine in its expansive, generous sense. Not as a not as a, a police warrant, but as as a kind of principle of anti-colonialism and national sovereignty. But the pushback that Wilson got from conservatives who didn't want to give up U- United States sovereignty, right? The people who ta- eventually tanked the League of Nations and prevented the Senate from ratifying the League of Nations, they seized on the Monroe Doctrine. And they wanted to know if the League of Nations was going to override the Monroe Doctrine, you know, not allow the United States to act with mandatory power unilaterally wherever it need be. And Wilson completely caved on that question. He started out talking about the League of Nations. If you want to know what the League of Nations is, look at the look at the Monroe Doctrine, look at Pan-Americanism, look what we've done in the Americas. We've created a continent of free, sovereign nations. That's what we want for the world. But in order to appease the nationalists and the chauvinists in Paris, he totally gave in. He gets a telegram from Senator Taft saying, you know, there's no way that this is going to pass unless there's some specific acknowledgement that the Monroe Doctrine is is untouchable. And so Wilson has them insert in charter of the League of Nations that regional understandings such as the, especially the Monroe Doctrine will will not be affected. So, it, you know, so you see exactly the kind of tension between the Monroe Doctrine as this, as this anti-colonial principle and this Monroe Doctrine as this assertion of national chauvinism and informal empire clashing. And most, most of the time they reconcile these different positions. So going back to your question, what has been its major legacy, it's in some ways the gateway drug or the gateway legal principle through which the United States has been able to kind of reconcile its different competing impulses from isolationism on one end of the spectrum to a international globalism on, on the other, hand, other side of the spectrum. That happens in Latin America. Hey listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying Eco Justice Radio. Stay connected by subscribing on, on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests, listen to extended episodes, and get connected with us on social media. Today you're listening to Simon Bolivar, The Monroe Doctrine and U.S. Intervention in Latin America. I'm your host, Jack Ide, and we share clips from a podcast series called Under the Shadow. Historian Greg Grandin and journalist Michael Fox examine the long shadow of the Monroe Doctrine, which continues to shape U.S. imperialism in Central and South America. But first, the Nicaraguan poet Ruben Dario, who died in 1916. The America of Moctezuma and Atahualpa. The aromatic America of Columbus, Catholic America, Spanish America, the America where noble Cuauhtémoc said, I am not on a bed of roses. Our America trembling with hurricanes, trembling with love. O men with Saxon eyes and barbarous souls, our America lives and dreams and loves, and it is the daughter of the sun. (laughs) 
be careful. That was Ruben Dadio, Nicaraguan poet. Greg, if you were going to try and explain to somebody who just had no clue about its impact then later over the many years or what it's become Monroe Doctrine and the excuses it's been you know, used for invasions and things like that. I just gave the more kind of Hegelian version of what the Monroe Doctrine is. But the fact of the matter is that when its power, when it's asserted is, you know, it doesn't really become a doctrine. The phrase Monroe Doctrine or Doctrine of Monroe doesn't come into circulation until about the 1850s or 60s when the United States is in competition with Great Britain to build a canal through Nicaragua. And, and so that's when the Monroe Doctrine gets asserted. And the United States doesn't have the power to enforce, you know, the hands off the Americas principle of the Monroe Doctrine till much later. Then as time goes on, the Monroe Doctrine becomes more of a doctrine of, as I mentioned, informal empire, mandatory power. And this is explicit with Theodore Roosevelt and, and his corollary, which says, you know, the Monroe Doctrine basically gives the United States the right to police the hemisphere. Another Secretary of State, Olney, I think, said that the United States is, you know, sovereign across the hemisphere and not sovereignty is found in the Monroe Doctrine. It does become associated with interventionism, with regime change, with the United States' and meddling in Latin American affairs. And so then what you see later, when uh, it's no longer acceptable to speak in the kind of language of Theodore Roosevelt, where you have to at least pay lip service to Latin American sovereignty. You know, if you Google the Monroe Doctrine is dead or, you know, the Monroe Doctrine is over, you'll you'll see if you do an engram of it, you know, there's different moments, right? Like after the pink tide, you know, after Lula and Chavez were elected in the early in the early 2000s, there were lots of essays about the end of the Monroe Doctrine. I think the Council of Hemisphere Affairs said the Monroe Doctrine is over. You know, so there's lots of declarations on the Monroe Doctrine being over. But now you listen to the Republicans and they're once again explicitly reasserting the Monroe Doctrine. So it's just this it's a totem. It's a totem in U.S. politics. You know, it's super interesting. Uh, the The guy who completely forgetting his name right now, but he was just voted out of the, he was the head of the House uh, Republican because he wasn't strong enough. Kevin McCarthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he went and spoke. I found this clip online like a couple of weeks ago at Oxford and he's, and it's, and it was a debate over U.S. intervention. And so he starts off by saying, well, we all know that U.S. intervention is good. <laughs> and that's like the beginning of, of right. his, the rest of the yeah, conversation. Yeah, you know, the United puts, States had no, right. Right. So that was like the, that was like the, right. Okay. I get it. Right. It's still a thing. This is still a, now let me, how is manifest destiny wrapped up into this? Yeah. Manifest destiny is, it's related in the sense that it's about United States expansion. And it was a phrase coined by John O'Sullivan. It was, a, you know, one of these uh, expansionists that was around, during the time of uh, the annexation of Texas and the Mexican-American War, when the United States was pushing hard uh, west, you know, to get to the Pacific. And there was a lot of different vectors of that propulsion west. There was the desire to kind of extend the country to diffuse the slavery conflict, the idea that, you know, there'd be free and slave states admitted you know, one after the other. And, you know, but that that basically just delayed the ultimate coming of the Civil War. But there was this idea that expansion would, would somehow s resolve the problem. There was the idea of expansion as a safety valve for for workers, for, you know, for the immigrants that were pouring in, that giving that free land would, would solve the problem of high rents and low wages in New York and in Boston. There was a clear sense that the West was valuable, that there was land and, and minerals and, and, you know, that it was basically collateral for United States expansion. The United States could basically hold up, you know, the, the prospect of taking the West as collateral on, on loans to capitalize its development. There was a lot of drivers of Western expansion. And John O'Sullivan was of a generation that was called Young America. 
that saw Western expansion as keeping the United States young. And in some ways, it was a perverse corollary of the war of the revolutions of 1848 in Europe, where the wars and the revolution of 1848 in Europe offered the they were all defeated and they were all put down, but at least they put the social question on the table. And they were the beginnings of labor parties and, and trade union. And there was this notion of a European spring and you know and, and they were going to overthrow the old monarchs and there would be a there would be a young Europe. And the way that manifested in the United States was perversely not by fighting, not through class struggle against the oligarchs and the aristocrats upward, but but fighting against Indians westward. So John O'Sullivan was an ardent expansionist. He was a proponent of the war and of, of going to war in Mexico to take Mexico to get to the Pacific. And he came up with the expression manifest destiny. That's the United States' manifest destiny to, to, to occupy the continent fully. And it's a very subjectivist, romantic, Hegelian sentiment, right? That the, you know, that there's potential manifest within the thing itself that, you know, that will being and becoming that what it, the United States is, is not yet, you know, and it will be, and it will be when it fills out the continent. And that's the expression manifest destiny. And, you know, even young Walt Whitman, who later on kind of repents from his imperialism, I mean, he was gung-ho about the Mexican-American War, thought the United States should take all of Mexico. So there was also uh, debates within the United States about how, how much of Mexico the United States should take. And race factors into that. Is that there, was, there was an all-Mexico movement after the United States defeated Mexico in 1848, but also there was concern that maybe by particularly among southern slavers that maybe the united states should only take the sparsely populated northern parts of mexico rather than those parts down south with all of those <laughs> troublesome native americans so it's it's an inter- it's interesting the way those debates intersect between imperialism and racism yeah absolutely greg i want to walk back to kind of the monroe doctrine moment 1820s right was there a time, and it's interesting, so one of the things I'm, I'm, I want to do in Panama City is go to the place where Bolivar held his, the Panama Congress, right? Because that was kind of like this moment where there's the United States, but there's also this possibility of the Gran Colombia maybe uniting all the rest of, of Latin America. It could, could we look at that moment as, as a time where things could have gone differently had they had those had the the Latin American countries been able to unite in a, in, a, in a different way? Talk a little bit about kind of that that moment there. Yeah, so the, I mean the, eight, the you know Bolivar, you know the wars of Spanish independence uh, end around 1823 1824, and Bolivar had earlier in his letter from Jamaica talked about. America as a large confederation. By the 1820s, it was clear that that it wouldn't be a single nation. There was too much division and competition among the different political classes of each Peru and Chile and Mexico. But he still hoped that there could be a confederation. And in the thing about we talk about American exceptionalism, and we and we tend to think of American exceptionalism as unique to the United States. But the independence leaders of, the, of Spanish America saw the New World as an exceptional place, as a place to in which where humanity would be renovated, would be redeemed, in which the old superstitious monarchies would be overthrown, where a kind of new kind of republicanism would allow for the fullest expression of human freedom. Spanish American Republicans tended to be more ambitious in their vision of what a just society is. They understood that slavery had to end, that that abolition and emancipation would be part of it. That didn't happen everywhere at the same time in Spanish America because of political conditions and the conditions on the ground. But there was a a sense among independence leaders that it was non-negotiable. Independence from Spain meant emancipation from slavery, whereas that wasn't necessarily the case in in the United States. So one of the topics on the agenda in 1826 was to talk about New World abolition. Uh, Another topic on the agenda was the internationalization of the Monroe Doctrine. How do we turn the Monroe Doctrine into international law? And by that, they meant anti-colonialism. 
Latin Americans came up with a, a different theory of sovereignty. What, but if they read the whole thing, they would see that that its theory of sovereignty was actually an affirmation of the doctrine of conquest, you know, moving west and taking Indian land. Latin Americans, on the other hand, didn't have that option, right? Latin Americans didn't have the option of endless expansion as a theory of of Republican sovereignty because they had to deal with each other. This is the thing about the difference between the United States came into the world a single child. <laughs> you know, it, it had decrepit European empires with barely a hold on their territory to the West and time out of mind indigenous communities that they knew would just recede away with time as, as civilization progressed. But Spanish America came into being as like an already conceived community of nations. So, And the thing is that they both legitimated and threatened the other. They legitimated the, uh, themselves because their independence affirmed that the overthrow of Spanish Catholic uh, royalism was legitimate. But they threatened because under the old doctrine of conquest and old inter- uh, uh, and and was was understood as international law, war was legitimate and conquest was legitimate. What would stop Argentina from saying our destiny lies in climbing the Andes and taking Chile and making it to the Pacific? And the, you know, why would why doesn't why didn't Argentina want to get to the Pacific, just like the United States wanted to get to the Pacific? Well, it couldn't because because these nations were already they had to figure out how to live with each other. And the way they did that was a doctrine of sovereignty that affirmed the volatility of borders. You know, the Roman law doctrine, as you possess, ute poseditus. But they basically said, look, we have to take Spanish borders as they existed in 1810, and these are the borders that we have. And we, the fact of the matter is there were conflicts and there was there were territorial skirmishes over where the borders lay, especially if resources were involved. And we say this, see the same thing now with Venezuela and Guyana. But they affirmed the principle that that borders were untouchable and nations were sovereign within those borders. That's a very different definition of sovereignty than the United States had. So when Bolivar said that the the agenda, that one of the items on the agenda was to affirm the Monroe Doctrine as international law, that's what he meant. He meant a firm, a revocation of the doctrine of conquest and an affirmation of anti-colonialism and anti-conquest and anti-intervention. Greg, I want to fast forward a little bit to in the direction of more recent history. One of the things I was fascinated by in your book, um, Empire's Workshop, was death squads and the U.S., like, like they're basically a brainchild of the United States, right? Like the U.S. Is, sees this well, as a means... Yeah. <laughs> but use this you you sees this as a means of putting pressure and using violence as a means to kind of push you know in in terms of its like larger counterinsurgency strategy and whatnot in the 1960s well i mean death squads i mean the use of para para politics or extrajudicial power repression is not is not new and it's not i don't think particularly unique to the united states uh, landlords you know rely on strong men in order to secure their property. I think it's, it, and certainly in Latin America, there was use of paramilitaries and, and you know, extrajudicial repression prior to the Cold War. But what happens after the Cuban Revolution, it's really the Cuban Revolution that, that galvanizes the United States to begin to what they call professionalize the security forces in Latin America. Policymakers in Washington have this vision of Latin America as being fairly incompetent in its internal security, that there are these competing security agencies. Maybe there's like something to the equivalent of a treasury police or a border police. There's the regular police, there's the military and every, and you know, they're run by gangsters that are more interested in consolidating their jurisdiction and their and their collections from, from then, than they are in, in being professional guardians of, of national security. So the United States spends really goes into Latin America in, in 1960 and really begins to work with, spends an enormous amount of money and energy in what they call professionalizing and centralizing the central intelligence agency, centralizing the security agencies of, of allied nations. And it means replacing kind of more thuggish figures with people that that are more committed to 
fighting communism that have close ties to the to the United States through these security programs and training programs and what it means is is what it means on the ground is getting these units capable of capturing individuals uh, extracting information through torture and then acting on that information to act on a wider radius and then to do it again and again and again. And also included in this is the storage of information. What do you do with the information? How do you analyze it? How do you collate it? So basically, it's, it's about creating little central intelligence agencies in all of these Latin American nations that are effective, that are rapid response so evidence seems to suggest that Venezuela and Guatemala were the two countries in which the United States were very much involved in creating these agencies that were able to carry out collective disappearances, um, collective kidnappings, apprehensions, and then interrogating the prisoners, and then acting again to capture even more. So this is part of the process, and this happens in every country. And you can think of Operation Condor as that process on on a continental scale. So you're not just in, so you're integrating the security forces of any given nation, and you get that integration locked down and functioning. And then what you do is you begin to integrate the security agencies of of nations into a larger transnational consortium. That's what Operation Condor is. That on a larger scale. So in the 60s, you see it happening on the national level. By the time you get to the 70s, it's happening on a continental level. Hey, listeners, quick break here. We hope that you're enjoying EcoJustice Radio. Stay connected by subscribing on on all major podcast apps and visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, to check out previous shows and guests, listen to extended episodes, and get connected with us on social media. Today, you're listening to Simon Bolivar. The Monroe Doctrine and U.S. Intervention in Latin America. I'm your host, Jack Ide, and we share clips from a podcast series called Under the Shadow. Historian Greg Grandin and journalist Michael Fox examine the long shadow of the Monroe Doctrine, which continues to shape U.S. imperialism in Central and South America. Consider this from The General in His Labyrinth. A 1989 historical novel by Colombian author and Nobel Prize winner Gabriel Garcia Marquez. The novel tells the story of the last seven months of the life of South American military and political leader Simón Bolívar. America is ungovernable. The one that serves a revolution pitching at sea, this country will fall hopelessly into the hands of the rampant crowd and go to almost imperceptible tyrants of all colors and races and many other gloomy thoughts that already circulated scattered in the letters to different friends. Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Greg, so there's this question that's been lingering in the back of my head. Would love, would love your, uh, your thoughts on this. Was this all ever about, you know, spreading democracy and freedom? And, you know, because that, that's like that's like what's ingrained in, in everybody's like, you know, if you do a poll, probably half the United States would still say, yay, we're benevolent and it's good. And we're like almost like we're like Santa Claus bringing freedom and democracy around the world. Like so like, is was was it ever about that, you know, like or or is that just the discourse? And how did that discourse like like wh- when did that discourse get? get synced up with the foreign policy and whatever else. Like I know like in Reagan time, he started to do more of that, right? Of like talk about, oh, human rights and stuff, even and, and pick up more things from the from like the, the left and progressive sectors to try and win, yeah. you know, the, the, the media campaign. Anyway, I'll leave it with you. <laughs> you know, for a long time, it was the Democratic Party that was the party of idealism in the sense of, of, of you know, justifying a, interventionism abroad through these high ideals. JFK and the and the Alliance for Progress was the high point of that. You know, the, the Alliance for Progress was going to complete the revolution of the Americas, you know, and bring development. And, you know, it's also a moment of Keynesian economics where the welfare state is seen as the endpoint of history. And and of course there are there were structural 
reasons why the political econ- why the global political economy produces immiseration in these countries that isn't going to be overcome through the kind of reforms the Alliance for Progress were, were proposing, but they still had that rhetoric that the idea was to bring development uh, and raise the standard of living of and that's how you and that's how you prevent revolution. The Republicans tended to always be the party of uh, you know to shy away from that kind of high flying rhetoric and 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 really talk of order and and you know if we had to intervene we're basically doing it you know for national security reasons. That switch that does switch with Reagan. That is what is consequential about Central America in the 1980s is that Reagan remoralizes. U.S. power, and he remoralizes capitalism, right? And, 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 and the free market becomes a site of freedom and a site of creativity. And, and Reagan is, is central to this, right? And, and support for the Contras and support for debt squad states in Guatemala and El Salvador. Reagan was, he was, he was shameless in, in talking about these people capable of committing and committing the worst savagery as the, as the moral equivalent of the founding fathers. You know, like Thomas Paine, we have the power to begin the world anew. And it goes to first principles. And this is why, you know, this is why Chile in 1973 is so important. And this is why the lib- libertarians are so interesting. It's not because there aren't m- larger historical and structural processes and changes that bring about neoliberalism. It's not like neoliberalism is hatched in the mind of of Friedrich Hayek, but they do talk about it in foundational first principle ways, so you know what's at stake. So when they talked about overthrowing Allende, they were open about the need for repression, that you have to force people into freedom that you have to force people into democracy. Allende was the terminus of a 70-year period of a false conception of democracy, uh, social democracy, social welfare. And we, we have to strip all of that away. And even if it means a 17-year dictatorship, we're educating people in freedom. And because they see freedom, they see democracy as rooted in the free market, in the protection of private property, and in indiv- supposedly individual cho- choice, except you know when they choose, except when they choose to have national health care. So whether it's hypocrisy or not, you know, I mean, ideology operates on different levels. I think in different registers, you know, a lot of it is just like foam that washes off of people. Oh yeah, yeah, we're doing that, and you know, they they have only the dimmest perception of what's going on anywhere. And then there's other people that are like that that see every. In every event, a referendum over first principles, you know, the election in Argentina, uh, Millet, you know, he's one of these true believers. Yeah, it's so complicated. Um, it is. It's complicated. There's so many layers. There's so many layers. I want to talk a little bit about the Contra War. I feel like it's A, completely lost in the past and usually amongst society kind of chalked up to, oh, a few bad apples. Yeah, that Ollie North guy, he testified a bunch and yeah, he did some really bad things. But it's like, this was a thing that was stretched across operations amongst the the major portions of the US government, the CIA, State Department, whatever else. Talk about what this was, how important this was, how it was involved, the CIA, and and why this was so important for Reagan and the US at that time. Well, I think that Central America in general, and the, the, the bigger point is, I use this in the book Empire's Workshop, Jean Kirkpatrick, who's Reagan's ambassador to the United Nations, a position that Reagan elevated to sec- a secretary level position. She called Central America the most important place in the world for the United States critically important. I mean, this is 1982. There's a lot of things happening in 1982. There's Israel's war in Lebanon. There's, there's the aftermath of genocide in Cambodia. There's you know nuclear arms treaties. There's a lot of things going on. And to call Central America the most important place in the world for the United States is an interesting quote. And what I what the way I think about it is, is it was the most important place in the world because it was the least important place in the world. It was it was a place that had no significant patrons that the United States had to worry about. It had no nuclear arms. It it had no major resources other than coffee and sugar. So Reagan can give the region to the movement ideologues that brought him to power. Reagan had to to act more cautiously 
in the rest of the world. I mean, Reagan came to power saying he was going to sweep it all away, that, you know, he was going to confront the Soviet Union. You know, he left that mic on. We didn't begin bombing in five minutes or, you know, that whole thing. But the fact of the matter is that Reagan acted quite cautiously everywhere except Central America, because he could just give it to he could give it to, you know, the base, the activists, the true believers. And that base was composed of different components. There were the religious right. There was the neoconservatives. There was the jaundiced, angry Vietnam vet revanchists who were angry that they lost Vietnam. There was general mercenaries. There were, you know, there was a, the whole. There was a lot of different sectors within within the conservative movement that came together in Central America. I mean, Central America, when Reagan came to power, was in a boil. The, the Sandinistas had just won, defeated the Somoza regime, and the Contra War hadn't yet gotten started. It looked like insurgencies might very well do the same in El Salvador and in Guatemala, and. Of course, this was all going on as the United States just lost Iran in 1979. So the United States couldn't do anything in Iran, but they could do something in Nicaragua. And those two things uncannily came together when the United States, when Reagan sold high tech weapons. And the larger context of this is that you have a democratic controlled Congress that doesn't want to restart the Cold War necessarily. The Democrats wind up going along with Reagan uh, and not really uh, putting up major opposition. But but for the most part, there's still a lot of these post-Watergate, post-Vietnam checks on executive power. So, I mean, we know the story that agents of the United States, Oliver North, William Poindexter, and people like that, begin very complicated fundraising regime, which included selling high-tech weapons to Iran, to the Ayatollahs and Mullahs in Iran, and using the money to fund the Contras. They also began at the same time fundraising other ways. So this was all new emerging presidential coalitions work out their international alliances. And it was through Central America that the new right made its ties with conservative Gulf countries. You know, Saudi Arabia kicked in money. Israel kicked in money. You know, private sector, Ross Perot kicked in money for the Contras. Then there was a lot of grassroots fundraising from the, you know, from the religious right to support the Contras. So the Contra war becomes this kind of crusade for the, for the new right. And the fact that the Sandinistas were as much Christian as they were Marxist, right? The rise of liberation theology... Um, at the you know at the same time as the rise of evangelical Christianity puts these two very different versions of Christianity on a collision course, and the crash site is is Nicaragua. So uh, a lot of the Christian right see in in Nicaragua a kind of holy war. You know, before they move on to political Islam, it's liberation theology that they have to contest, and what's often not discussed about, we talked about first principles, is that a lot of the revitalization of the free market as a site of human fulfillment and creativity wasn't just a secular project, the Hayaks and the, you know, Von Mises. Christian, the Christian New Right had their economists, and their economists, you don't know about them because they're kind of obscure, but they were arguing against liberation theology, point by point where liberation theology said that the free market was an amoral site of greed and 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 unholy uh, competition they said that the the you know that the market was 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 the place where god's grace was manifest where the virtuous were rewarded and the wicked punished where the liberation theologians said that if you look at the global political economy with desperately poor crisis stricken nations and a handful of nations with more wealth than Jehovah himself. The Christian right economist said that reflects God's grace, that these countries are poor because they deserve to be poor, because they live in sin. And, you know, this is like straight out of some medieval, you know, medieval shit, you know, updated for the 20th century. So the Contra War becomes this real crucible of the new right. It brings together these different constituencies theocons and neocons and militarists and and it allows for a not a reactive response to liberation theology but a proactive response like we're taking on the arguments themselves 
And it also created the kind of covert network that bound these co- these coalitions together, these fundraising coalitions and these covert oper- operatives. And it, it also began to lay the justification for the rehabilitation of an imperial presidency. So if you jump forward ahead to the Iran-Contra hearings, you know, the Democrats basically focused on procedural issues. They didn't question the United States' right to try to contain the Sandinistas. They agreed with Reagan that the Sandinistas were a problem that had to be dealt with. They just didn't think that the United States should be running a covert war against the Sandinistas. So, um, and they fo- and they and they focused mostly on a rogue national security agency that that was basically running wild and needed to be reined in. And they issued a report. The dissenting report was was written by Richard Dick Cheney, who was a congressman from Wyoming at the time. And he puts forth the theory of unitary power, what becomes known as the theory of unitary power, that at the time was seen as too extreme. It invested in the in, in the executive branch, the ability to wage war wherever it wanted to wage war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's in 1986, 1987. Jump forward to 2003. The theory of unitary power is like basically is 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 on the table. It's what they use openly to justify the war on terror. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, so Central America becomes a kind of, you know, it's marginal, but it's it's on the margins where this coalition is worked out and where I where they feel test their ideas, they feel test their their strategies and 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 and, and then it it kind of becomes mainstream. Amazing, Greg. Thank you. Okay, to close us out here, why is this history, this history of U.S. involvement, particularly in Central America, because that's where my, that's my focus um, on the podcast, but in Latin America in general, why is this important today? Why is this important for a U.S. audience today? Look at the world today, right? And you look at the, the war in Gaza and the war in Ukraine, and the inability to deal with climate change, and the serial crises that are engulfing the world, whether you want to call them the poly crisis or the multi-form crisis, whatever you want to call it. What's striking is that the lack of imagination of our political class to imagine a way forward. I mean, even before the, the, Gaza, the war in Gaza broke out, what was the vision of of what was supposed to be in place once the Ukraine war ended, if Russia was defeated. I mean, nothing but a kind of a kind of old school balance of power with the United States locked into competition with China. You know, Latin America has a million problems, but for the most part, it's a region that actually functions. There's no interstate wars. They have a, a vital and vibrant left that still wins elections, not obviously the right is, you know, the right is still strong and it makes its comebacks, but they still have a vision of, of citizenship that, in, that means social citizenship, that, that democracy means not just the right to vote, but that actually, you know, the, the, the right to, to demand a dignified life of health care and education. So I think that Latin America is important in that way, as the United States bungles around and tries to figure out you know, some kind of, I mean, hopefully there will be a new reform ruling coalition or or, or at least a new coalition. And, and they could look to Latin America for ideas. I mean, you go back to 1933, it was Latin America. Roosevelt turned to Latin America to revitalize liberalism. You know, it was, I mean, this is a whole nother story, which we don't have time to go into. But the New Deal took a lot of its ideas from Latin America. And to a large degree, Roosevelt was able to kind of redeem liberalism, revitalize it, and inject it with a new kind of animating spirit through what was going on in the Mexican Revolution, truly accepting the sovereignty of individual nations. So you could imagine Latin America serving as a as a model. Petro in Colombia has ideas for how, for how to get off fossil fuels. There's proposals for how to end the drug war. You know, Lula has a, a vision of, of what a what an, a new international order should look like that wasn't just based on balance of power. There are ideas in Latin America, you know, that that could serve as a template for some of the crises that we seem to be 
you know, engulfed by and it seemed to be intractable. Amen to that. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciate it. This is so great. Under the Shadow is a co-production in partnership with The Real News and NACLA. The theme music is by my band Monte Perdido. This is Michael Fox. Many thanks. Hey, listeners, to check out the extended recording of this show or to explore our other shows, visit our website, ecojusticeradio.org, and subscribe to our podcast. This has been Ecojustice Radio and our show, Simon Bolivar, The Monroe Doctrine and U.S. Intervention in Latin America. Thank you to the podcast series Under the Shadow with Greg Grandin and host Michael Fox. And thank you to our listeners for joining us. Please connect with us on social media at Eco Justice Radio, SoCal 350, and Wilder Utopia. If you like what you've heard and you want others to be informed, subscribe and share the episodes. You have been listening to Eco Justice Radio, a project of SoCal 350, executive producer and host myself, Jack Ike, co-host Jessica Aldridge, co-host Carrie Kim, and engineer and original music by Blake Quake Beats. And until next time, remember, the power is yours. <laughs>